very nice. I'll take the dick chair. <laughs> Welcome to episode 13 of D.A.D. It's Odyssey. I'm Fergal O'Connor. And I'm Owen Murphy. Here are your headlines. The Jump Street and Lego Movie directors are in talks to direct the Flash movie. The Twin Peaks revival with, with David Lynch is now just the Twin Peaks revival. Confusion reigns supreme with the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo trilogy. And Kevin Smith has announced plans to blow up a shopping mall. And we review Furious 7. So, not content with just uh, producing the upcoming Lego Batman film, Phil Lord and Chris Miller are uh, deciding to direct an actual real-life superhero film. <laughs> with less uh, with less real life, but with more real people. Uh, yeah, so live-action-like. Uh, yeah, that's another part for what I'm trying to say. They're taking over the helm of The Flash, possibly. Uh, right now they're just circling the project, but it, things are looking pre- pretty good. Especially since these are the guys who directed Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, the Lego movie, and 21 and 22 Jump Street, which the you last see, three... I, you are... see, I think, I think that the fact that they did 21 and 22 Jump Street would, have me more, would give me more faith in them doing Flash well, rather than the animated stuff. Mm. Oh yeah, I mean like the animated stuff is more of a special effects thing mm, yeah. in terms of how damn good they made a Lego movie look. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean the 21 and 22 Jump Street uh, are important as well just because so much of because at least it's, Barry they're, Allen... They're almost Allen, action comedy. They're comedy actions, you know what I mean? Yeah, at least uh, ba- Barry Allen version of The Flash, he is very much in that almost Spider-Man mold of constantly uh, quipping. The problem while is you can't even talk about that because you know it's dc and dc have the whole you know no laughs kind of thing there is no laugh track include included with dc uh, you'd think so but uh, this director choice uh, would seem to indicate yeah, that a different is, direction it's, it's a strange one like if you if you took such a hard line against humor why would you it didn't include directors who are known for comedy yeah um i don't know but they have made like three of my favorite comedies the last few years mm-hmm in a uh, Lego movie was just terrific as a kid's film. And then 21 and 22 Jump Street yeah, were so yeah. yeah, they were like some of the most like self-aware comedies out there. Now, admittedly, I t- did they have Michael Bacall on that in the writing staff? Because uh, if Michael Bacall was Not in sure. there, I believe he was. Uh, he's uh, He's kind of known for doing that sort of self-aware stuff. Okay. So it could have come from that direction, but still... Yeah, the 22 Jump uh, Street was quite freaking meta, wasn't it? Yeah, like... Uh, More on that later. <laughs> yeah, uh, d- just watch the film, kids. Uh, it's uh, it, it's worth your while. But uh, it does bode well, because mm-hmm. uh, I feel like that's... Um, yeah, That's definitely. an element of the Flash to differentiate so much. I mean, one problem I with the no laughs policy is that at that point, how do you differentiate each or each of your characters? Yeah, that was that and, was the big the big problem. Like, I mean, like that's uh, so it it's strange that they're changing it, but I would welcome the change. You know? Yeah. Mm. Now I'm not saying this In is policy. the only solution. Yeah. Of yeah. Course. Because one way to do that would be say, it would be to give each character a different journey and make another tone that's not necessarily comedy work within the film. Yeah. But that being said, the, the same fact how many dark and, how many dark and brooding superheroes can you have at a time? Yeah, I'm not just saying dark and brooding. I'm that's like, what I'm saying. Yeah, it's uh, like even within the no laugh zone, there yeah. still it, there still is room for heroes that are. It, that their films are sitting at different levels of tonality. Yeah, I know. What you yeah, mean. but <laughs> getting getting back on point, like this just uh, this just shows that they're differentiating their films because if there's one thing that Phil Lord and Chris Miller aren't, they're not Zack Snyder. They've shown over the past few years they know how to send an audience home happy. Yeah. No. It... <laughs> the way you make it sound like. I mean, it's uh, it's good because one, they're differentiating. Two, these guys are fucking great, and I look forward to seeing how this one turns out. As per usual, I will add: please don't fuck it up. If you're playing the Idiot's Odyssey drinking game, you can drink now. David Lynch has thrown his his toys out of his pram. Uh, his <laughs> his toys being Twin Peaks, and the pram the pram being Showtime, as he's now actually left the Showtime, and so you know. 
of course, Twin Peaks will will still be actually be going ahead with its nine episodes in yeah. 2016. I mean, Lynch broke that on Twitter this yeah. week, and uh, he, apparently he was unhappy with the amount of money that was offered to do the script. And quote, and quote, after one year and four months of negotiations, I left because not enough money was offered to do the script the way I felt it needed to be done. End quote. Uh, yeah. like that uh, that's just a very confusing one as in like they didn't want was it a low a too low a budget or was it a case of he wasn't getting enough money in, into his into his into his paws to to make more transcendental uh, meditation centers yeah please come back to us David Lynch come uh, back from like the room in your mind where you're meditating to make more films we like your films yeah, uh, the, Blue Velvet, Mulholland Drive. But the good news is that it's it's still going to be going ahead. So Twin Peaks will still be going ahead. Now the fact is, I'm not entirely sure if he actually wrote the script and then he left, and so he's not going to be directing. Like, but he would still have written it, yeah. or if he just like left before he ri- written it. No, I think they had nine episodes done. Well, him in collaboration with Mark Frost. No, as in like they had nine episodes. Is going to be nine episodes. But I don't think they've made it yet because that's why he left because of direction. Oh God! So, oh, no. but they are going. It's still going to be made. Is the thing? Well, I guess they still have Mark Frost. But I mean, thinking back to Twin Peaks, mm. and, uh, the original series, it did have very David Lynch moments of just stuff that shouldn't be happening in reality happening because uh, that's the way David Lynch rolls. Yeah, definitely. But the, the, he also has said on on Twitter. That uh, this weekend, I I started to call a- actors to let them know I won't I w- would not be directing. Twin Peaks may still may still ver- be very much alive on Showtime at Showtime. Yeah. Well, so like he just says he isn't directing, but he could still have written it, right? Yeah, which uh, I mean I don't think that David Lynch is some sort of mysterious formula that no cannot be replicated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and but the fact that, is, this. No, I mean the reason that David Lynch's films are so unique, I think, is just because that he hasn't been a, like he showed that he could do it before and he could be successful before, and someone took a risk mm. on him. But I don't think that the that it's, the thing is that people can't replicate that, or that there aren't other people out there who can't do that. It's just that uh, it's very unlikely that people will take a risk on people who want to make material that weird. So potentially there are other collaborators out there who could step into the void and do basically, a really good job. Yeah, so basically people who are inspired to kind of have that kind of, that, that similar kind of uh, way of directing yeah. could, could fill the void. Uh, yeah, I think by similar way of directing, it's like this weird random shit is happening, but it happens in such a sort of a dreamscape-like way that it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which is sort of the space and nearly everything. But I'd, ima- I'd imagine that kind of stuff, would those kind of directors would be more common these days than they were in the early 90s because of David Lynch. Yeah. While the Dragon, t- the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo uh, trilogy ha- has been... Constantly, constantly said whether it'll be off and or on, and last time we heard it was going to definitely be off. It, it's apparently going could be back on, because apparently, but this time without David Fincher. And, and apparently, Sony c- could very well be putting the the second and third book into one into one film, so that they'll be putting the girl who played with fire and the girl who kicked the hornet's nest into one film, right? Yep. Making the second film of the series. And then they would have the girl in Spider's Web, which was which will, and that novel will be coming out in I think the first of September. Yep. And that's written by a, di- a different not a different author, but still within the same continuing on the same story. Yeah. And that could be the third the third film of the trilogy. <laughs> like that's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? Yeah. Same world, different order. You know what this reminds me of. Mm. It reminds me of the time that they made the Born was the Born Legacy the one that uh, Tony Gilroy directed. Yes. Yeah. Um, that was based on, or well, they took the name from a book that it was the first uh, Born book that Robert Ludlum didn't write. Oh, okay. Yeah, and was a big crock of shit. 
Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's a parallel for how I think things uh, might uh, go here. I mean, a, an author is kind of a... It's a tricky thing to replicate someone's headspace. Yeah. But apparently they won't be using... They probably will not be using David Fincher if they were to go this route because of, you know, how much he bloody sp- he spent on the first one in comparison to how much the original budget was and how much they yeah. made back. However... Uh, Daniel Craig and Rooney Mara might would probably return due to their contracts would probably stipulate them having two more movies. I assume so, yeah. Mm. Uh, again, it's much would... like if you star in one shitty Fifty Shades of Grey film, you're tied in for at least another two. Pretty much, yeah. So they could very well be putting books two and three into one book, and then the fourth book that would be coming out would be put into the third book, and of course one of the, that would allow them to kind of, you know jump on top of the public consciousness of the of the stories. Yeah, I mean without David Fincher, uh, I've basically lost interest in this franchise. It depends on who they get in instead. Exactly. Because they still got a, they still uh, but, got a quality uh, cast like. I mean, I've no reason to be interested right now and I mean depending on who they bring in, I might uh, might become interested again. Mm, yes. So for fans of political intrigue, you've got a little something to look forward to next year. Uh, Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright will be returning to House of Cards for another season when Netflix releases season four next year. So they're they're on ter- season three right now, or they've released season three now. Though. Yeah. Okay. In the I think it was released in the Netflix way of releasing things, which is uh, everything at once. Yeah. Eh. It's like uh, I don't know. It encourages binge watching. I mean. Uh, it, I don't know anyone with the self-control and say, you know what, they released them all at once, but I'm just going to watch one a week. Uh, well, yeah. some of us have it, some of us don't. Most of us don't. Uh, you looking forward to it? I haven't watched uh, House Cards in season one, and it's something I keep meaning to go back to, because season one was absolutely fantastic. It's on my watch list somewhere. So prepare yourselves to have strange feelings for a CGI woman again. Because Olivia Wilde is going to be returning for Tron 3. Just to be clear, she's not completely CGI, as in she's not just doing the voice. Just to, yeah. Yeah, but still, it, it was like, it, I was like, where did the computer graphics end, and where where does Olivia Wilde begin? Yeah. Uh, and which part is turning me on? Am I being turned on by a virtual woman? What is going on? Why is this film so damn average? It was a very confusing film. Like, uh, it wasn't that confusing, really, though. Yeah, no, my feelings about it was, were confusing. The plot oh, was, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the plot wasn't ambitious enough to confuse anyone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like visually, fucking hell, it was gorgeous. But so, is, by the way, at the start, what is there actually a name for Trundry? I think uh, we don't have a name yet. Olivia Wilde. I think there was back, a few names um, rumored, but nothing actually confirmed. Yeah, yeah Garrett Headland's coming back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Which, uh, but there's no Jeff Bridges returning because he, he didn't his character die at the end. Ah uh, fuck! They can wreck it. They can retcon that, or they, they can just say uh, they can just t- throw in some weird reason why you would have Jeff Jeff Bridges in there. Yeah, but at the same time, this is one of those things that if you kind of bring a character back, you kind of defeat the purpose of getting him in the in the in the, in the, mid, in the second one. You know. Mm. Yeah, but uh, just because uh, they kill him for an emotional point there, but you could still bring him back or make the uh, make this about maybe he gets a or was Tron two about him getting a message from his father and going back in. I thought that was the point of it. Yeah, because uh, like maybe he find uh, maybe he finds out that there's some spark of his father left and he's got to go back on the grid. Except uh, it's some other way to twist it or maybe. So we'll we'll see anyway. Yeah, it's going to be going into production this fall. The plot, the plot details are all under wraps for now. And I'd that's be, there, I'd be horrified if it right. sounds anything like what Fergal just said. <laughs> so, when they announced the director for Deadpool, I wasn't actually that impressed. Because he was sort of a special effects uh, guy up to now, which didn't bode particularly well for the film itself. But... Uh, Deadpool is going to be R-rated. They're, they're okay. not pu- they're not pulling punches on you this see, one. This is one of those things that have been promised, and then had been not prom, and then had been like declared as a lie, and then like they're actually de- because I think Ryan Reynolds actually came out and said this will be the Deadpool that we d- deserve or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And then and then it came out with it was going to be PG thirteen, and then people weren't happy. Yeah, about but that. that was that was just an April Fool's joke. Oh right. Yeah, like I um, it was before April. Damn. Uh, apparently, it was on April, but. 
this uh, this thing is like every bit of news that's come out since the director thing has made me think that maybe they're gonna actually do this right and maybe this could be a good film i mean the cast they've got they're bringing in gina canaro who's uh, gonna be mm-hmm. gonna be great for stunts you're, uh, you've got uh, Marina Baccarin, who uh, we've yeah. uh, we've been over and over. You we've talked about it, yeah. The vast number of ways in which Marina Baccarin is fantastic. Yes. Ryan Reynolds, obviously, he, he sits in that, uh, in that sort of uh, range where he can uh, play a damn good Deadpool. There, He's good, uh, good at delivering sort of off-the-cuff remarks. Mm. And uh, he kind of nails that sort of self, yeah. uh, self-involved... Well, we'll see. Uh, see how he plays it out. But basically, uh, like every piece, uh, every piece of new sense has been great. So uh, I, it's going up in my estimation. I think it, especially isn't it with going the R rating. Is starting uh, filming soon. Uh, they've started filming. Okay. Set, yeah. So set very soon, as in for, now. <laughs> yeah. Super. Is so soon as in the past. And let's see. Oh, and Ed Skrine has after releasing his role, he will be playing. Ajax, yeah, A J A X or Francis. Sure, uh, if if we go with the Dutch pronunciation, why not? Yeah, well, well, seeing as it might be a Dutch name, seeing as there's a Dutch pronunciation, yeah. That's true. yeah. The mentally disturbed enforcer of Doctor Killebrew during the Weapon X program, who demanded respect from the Weapon X subjects, and you can guess how much respect he received from Deadpool. Yeah, so this basically it'll cover some of Deadpool's new backstory because he won't have the same backstory that he had in Wolverine Origins I'd assume so yeah uh, well I mean, uh, we uh, know he'll have different origins because of the whole time shift at, uh, or whatever the hell you want to call it at the end of X-Men Days of Future Past yeah assuming they're still working in that continuity which well, of course, I, I guess they are it, uh, I mean that's allowed it this to happen I assume yeah hopefully uh, regardless uh, I'm, I mean all the details co- coming out are you know, promising. Yeah. 22, Jump Street isn't the only thing that can be meta. We said we'd talk about it later, and we're talking about it later. 23, Jump Street. It's uh, coming to med school. Well, appa- <laughs> well appa- apparently they're, they've, they're finding a way to make those kind of joke pre- those joke uh, sequels at the end of twenty at the end of the uh, 22, Jump Street that were in the... Uh, credits. In, in credits, yeah. Yeah. They're finding a way to make them somewhat canon. Because Phil Lord has said that uh, Rotham has, or Rotman has found has had a really outrageous idea for for what to do. How how we could take our scorched earth sequel policy from the end of Twenty Two Jump Street and do something that hadn't been explored in the, in those Twenty Two sequels and simultaneously simultaneously tell the next chapter in the story. End quote. Uh, this of course is interesting, so that they, you know. These things still would have happened, but not, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's curious. Uh, I can't think of a way to do this myself, which makes me uh, it makes me hold out hope that the idea will actually be outrageous. No doubt that there's definitely ways they can do it, but I don't, none come to mind immediately that would actually work, really. Yep. So, I, you know, I guess we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I, this... I, I mean, you do got to trust the two guys, you know? Yeah, I, this is exciting. Just uh, just because it suggests uh, a novel premise for twenty three, exactly, and it suggests yeah. they still uh, they still have something original left of the tank. Right. So it's fair to say twenty three Jump Street will not be medical school. Most likely not medical school. <laughs> okay. So last week we got to talk uh, a little bit about we're so hyped for the Mad Max film that's coming out this year. So hyped. So I, mum, just because the trailer is absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they could, uh, they could have large bits of the plot just be Tom Hardy sitting on the toilet, and this, uh, this would still be one of the most visually stunning films uh, that's going to come out this year. Okay, that sounds a bit confusing, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, there's more in the pipeline. Tom Hardy is. Uh, he is contractually obligated for, to star in three more Mad Max films if this uh, goes well financially. Yeah. And heads up, it looks really good. Wait, if you didn't see that trailer, you should check it out. Wait, wouldn't it be two more? Hmm? Or is it three more? It says three more. Oh, that's... Yeah. I don't know. So, assuming that George Miller didn't blow his creative load on this film, 
which, uh, for, like he said, a lot of time to, to write this, I suppose, and the other three. Yeah, plus, uh, if again, I'm referring back to the trailer, which you should go and watch if I haven't made that abundantly clear by now. Um, I mean, it looked like he was trying to squash every idea he's had in the past 20 years into that film. Yeah. It was ridiculous uh, and incredibly exciting. Just because uh, we were so kind of barraged with all these different designs and crazy ideas and wackiness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it is entirely possible uh, that George Miller uh, just, uh, he's after throwing everything at the screen for this one. And now he's just like run out of ideas and he's going to have to go back to the drawing board for the other three. Yeah. But, well, he does have his new Mel Gibson and Tom Hardy. Yes, that's true. With all these talks of men mechs traders that Fergal's been drooling and completely drooling over, you might not want to hear this, but here you, here goes. Another reason to, to possibly see, you see Mad Max and actually go in early is because Mad Max Fury Road will debut the Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice trailer. The actual proper trailer, not the teaser that had previously been draft their own comic cons and stuff yeah so prepare for ben affleck in the actual bat suit yeah so th- we're about i guess we're, we're gonna you know that's another reason for me to go into it yeah uh plus uh, we might see some of those fight scenes that they were promising they were actually going to show batman fighting as opposed to say the christopher nolan man well showing keep batman in mind fighting. it's it's still a tr- it's still just going to be a a trailer, so they'll probably be like flashed through those anyway. Yeah, so but hopefully, we're, I'm just hoping to see some cool shit. That's yeah. all I want. Yeah, I mean, we I want to see the scope that they're kind of going with here, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is just uh, like Owen said. It's another reason to see the, Mad the, Max. The fact is, it's, this is just a news about a trailer, you know. Yeah, we're not even talking about the trailer. Yet. <laughs> and another trailer that we know will be, will be eventually be making its debut will be the Star Wars Episode 7 trailer. It's the second trailer, I think, you know? And this will become this will be debuting along with uh at the at the start I should say of the Avengers Age of Ultron movie. Yeah. So another reason to go there early. <laughs> yeah, I mean like uh, the thing about Star Wars coming out uh, in December is like never will I, I don't think I'll ever look as exci- be as excited to hear the words winter is coming as I uh, as I will be this autumn. Because yeah. it'll mean the, the new Star Wars is uh, on the way. Yeah, well, to be fair, this whole thing of that the Star Wars trailer coming out with the Avengers film was kind of... It was the prediction, you know? Yeah, because, I mean, it's an absolutely huge film to talk it in with. And, of course, you know, Disney owned both of them. Yeah. So, you have a reason to to come early to the Avengers film, but you ha- but the other news about it is that... You might not want to stay after if you, you don't want to be disappointed. Apparently, vendors will not be including a post credit scene. Oh, well. Which has become something of a Marvel tradition. But apparently, Joss Whedon believed that it didn't seem to lend itself in the same way to the film, and they wanted to be true to what felt right. Do you think there's an extent that he might not be, they might not be doing it because it's Joss Whedon's last film? Uh, well, what would be the reasoning behind that? I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not the bloody expert here like no one's yeah. an expert here we're idiots yeah it's a, it's all in the title people idiots odyssey yeah. right there but um, I would guess that I, I'd guess or would it just be the tone at the towards the end of the film potentially I mean they are still doing a credit scene as in somewhere mm. near the start middle of the credits so basically but, as opposed to the tr- what's now becoming this weird almost silly tradition of having like two of having almost two like post credit yeah. scenes we have the yeah. one in the middle and the one at the end you know yeah, and they're breaking with that but apparently we uh, Whedon's uh, idea for it was it just didn't feel right for this film which potentially yeah the tonality of the film could be one reason okay I mean another reason could be I mean it was the Avengers 1 was the post credit scene the Thanos reveal there was also the shawarma ah yeah, fuck it. How are they going to top shawarma? There are another bunch of idiots on their own on their own odyssey, as the idiots that that are the, the team behind Hunger Games are going are, are going to now be making the film adaptation of of Homer's Odyssey. Oh God, why? What did I do to deserve this? Um, it'll it'll 
be helmed by direc- director uh, Fra- Francis Lawrence, uh, who's directed uh, all of them since he's directed the second one and the third one and the second part of the third one. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, it'll be ri- written by uh, Peter Craig and it'll be produced by Nia uh, Jacobson, uh, who've all basically been involved in the production of the uh, Hunger Games. Uh, this is certainly a, an ambitious ter- choice, isn't it? To kind of go after Homer's Odyssey. Well, okay, first off, uh, if I remember right from reading the Odyssey, the Odyssey is a crock of shit. But uh, it's a classic I, crock of shit. Yeah, it's a classic crock of shit. It's a big epic story, but I mean, like, in large ways, it's as boring as reading the Bible. I mean, I, pe- whenever people talk about the Odyssey, they talk about, like, the exciting shit that happens in mm. there. But there's a lot of boring stuff in the between. Oh, God, yes. So much boring stuff. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the Odyssey, uh, like, there's a ton of good material in there, and I am kind of scared of them ruining it with some sort of tween bullshit. Oh, yeah. That is the that is the problem, like, as in... That, I mean, for... Like, as in... It, like how long is the, the the book like? It's quite large, isn't it? It's a big long poem. So if they have to if they had to divide the Hunger Games the the Mockingjay into into two halves, like how many parts will they have to divide the Odyssey in? Uh, well, I mean the, the Odyssey cannot be adapted in its current form, and oh, that yeah. scares me even more because unless they have some sort of incredible vision that they're bringing to the project. What's going to happen here is this gives them a lot, uh, like an absolute uh, miles and miles of uh, of slack to turn this into a bloody tween film. Yeah, that's the problem. There's a, there's too much kind of room for that. Yeah. But keep in mind that this would technically t- take place after Troy, right? As in... Yes. But... Well, I, I, I mean, like, to be fair, the Iliad rocked. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the Odyssey, uh, I'm like, uh, but, like, the Iliad is fucking amazing. Uh, I'm like, uh, I feel like it, genuinely, that was, uh, like, Homer, uh, something changed between when he wrote those two books. Okay. Because uh, the Iliad was all action all the time. Uh, and not so much for Homer's Odyssey. Yeah, uh, the Odyssey was, uh, there was a lot more ponderous bullshit. <laughs> nice. I'm pretty certain Brian Singer's after blowing his X-Men Apocalypse casting budget. Yeah. <laughs> he, yeah, because last week he cast an unknown as Jubilee. And this week he is ca- he is after ta- announcing the actor who will play Angel. And his sole credit apart from X-Men Apocalypse is fucking EastEnders. But to be fair, it's EastEnders, so he probably been there for a while. He was there for two years, I think, maybe three. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, EastEnders is EastEnders. I mean, this kid has EastEnders and he has a bunch of ab pics up on the Instagram or uh, or online for some reason. Okay. And that's everything. I mean, like, uh, I feel like... So, it, will, how big a role do you think he'll have? Uh, no idea. Like, because Singer released some because concept art Ar- this because week. Because Angel, or Archangel, is a pretty big character in... Uh, like, he was one of the founding members of the original team in the comics. Also, in terms of Apocalypse, he's actually got a really significant story in terms of Apocalypse. Ah. As in he... Well, I can't really... Don't know if it's spoiler because I don't know how closely they'll adapt it. But uh, in the... uh, In the comics, or at least in the animated series in the 90s, he was one of the... He became one of the the four horsemen of Apocalypse. Hmm. Even brief... Even though it was brief, I think. That's interesting. And he got a serious upgrade and went on a whole, yeah, so they, they, a whole vengeance kind of tour. <laughs> they could give a nod to that, but I feel like it... Your man's inexperience could, could could hamper it against that? Yeah, uh, yeah. well, more than that, it's just like, fuck what happened in the comic book. Exactly. You, you yeah, always work to the needs of the film. I hope you weren't to test your childhood, because Disney is fucking coming for it this year. Winnie the Pooh, which is now be now being remade by Disney. They've hired a writer and director, or at least a writer, in Alex Ross Perry, who wrote, wrote and directed Listen Up, Philip. And the focus of the film will be on an adult version of it, Christopher Robin. Who is, um, like, 
being treated for something for some mental illness is it <laughs> no I'm pretty certain that's what it, whenever Bill Watterson dies and they finally get their grubby hands on Calvin and Hobbes mm. but um yeah I don't know how to feel about this I, I feel like the Disney machine's kind of pumping them out at this stage and someone's biting out there especially since uh, this isn't the only uh, only childhood story that they're going to be uh, yeah Winnie the Pooh is one thing but they're also doing a live action version of Pinocchio and it's going to be produced by Disney and like they've already got they've already got their writer in Peter Hodges and but I don't know you know how do they even do this? Like, this is like the CGI would just be ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, like it, they're gonna have to be this. very gentle with the CGI. Although maybe then again they don't, because I mean you are sitting in a fairy tale world, so there is room for going way, 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 way beyond suspension of disbelief. Yeah, but also if you want, to, if you don't want to just the Disney version, which God only knows, it'll probably be you know flowers, and puppies, and all that crack. Yeah. Uh, you also have the Guimero del Toro version, uh, which is supposed to be darker, and it's already in development, and he is set to to uh, co-direct it, and it'll be stop-motion, animated, 3D film. So, you know, that, that sounds much more promising, in my opinion. Yeah, just because Guillermo del Toro is, uh, is attached, like, and I mean, del Toro has shown that he can do the dark fairy tale so well. Exactly, yeah. He showed it perfectly in uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's one version that I'm looking forward to, and there's one version I'm probably going to ignore. Yeah. <laughs> a while ago, we made we made note that Kevin Smith would be uh, ma- making Clerks 3 before he made Mo- Mo- Rats 2. But apparently that's been switched around a bit. Rats 2 will now be made before Clerks 3. And the reason is quite simple. They wanted to use specific mall, but uh, apparently the thing would, was going to be... Uh, demolished so instead they're going to actually record they're going to film inside it and then they're going to blow it up yeah so now they're working around the mall schedule which fair enough (laughs) yeah it's like you don't argue with a mall especially when it's getting blown up now kevin smith did say something about they really fucked them all up in the third act of the script as well so i guess it won't make a difference no matter what damage they do because the thing is going to be blown up in a exactly yeah which uh, kind of makes me hope that there's going to be a sort of a very um a low cgi feel to the uh, to the scene because they can just completely fuck that mall up yeah exactly from malls being blown up to two uh, a 500 uh, person human centipede Here's the human centipede news. Yeah, um... So, the human centipede tree plot synopsis is here. Happy Christmas to whichever one of our listeners is a sick fuck. It's Virgil, it's Virgil. Please, uh, no, I am the host who caters to the sick fucks out there. So, we have a release date. It will be on May 22nd. It will be 100% politically incorrect, no fucking shit, oh, well actually Jesus a ton Christ. of fucking shit. Oh lord. And will feature a 500 person human centipede made of American prison inmates. Very nice. I'll take the dead chair. <laughs> so, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read out this plot synopsis in full, because to say it, our sick fuck listener might not have jacked himself off properly yet. Bully prison warden Bill Boss, his name is Bill Boss, people, that I didn't make that up, is leading a big state prison in the US of A and has a lot of problems. His prison statistically has the highest amount of prison riots, medical costs and staff turnover uh, in the country, but foremost, he is unable to get the respect he thinks he deserves from his inmates and the state governor. And that's when the, the light bulb goes off in his head? What? Yeah, we're getting there. He constantly fails in experimenting with different ideas for the ideal punishment to get the inmates in line, which drives him, together with the sizzling heat, completely insane. Under threats of termination by the governor, his loyal right-hand man, Dwight, comes up with a brilliant idea, a revolutionary idea which could change the American prison system for good and save billions of dollars. An idea based on the notorious human centipede movies that will literally and figuratively get the inmates on their knees, creating the ultimate punishment and deterrent for anyone considering a life of crime. And, yeah, 
500 prisoner human centipede, book your tickets now. But like, if if he's saying his medical costs are going up, how the hell does he think this'll happen? This'll help, I should say. Well, I assume you're not going to be treating the, uh, treating the prisoners. I mean, like, you're just going to let them suffer. But you still have to attach the, everything. Yeah, but that's like a, a one-person job. You stitch someone's mouth to someone's ass and you're done. I'm like, stitches are quite cheap, but plus uh, it's not the most complicated of jobs to do, medically. So you're volunteering? Hmm? No, I'm just saying that the practicalities of putting together a 500-person human centipede aren't, uh, they're not as complicated or as difficult as you might think. Okay, right, I don't, I don't care. You can do this at home, kids. Don't do it at home, at home kids. That's just weird. So moving on stuff that normal people can jack off to, Universal wants <laughs> you and is back. The fuck for like? For Fast and Furious 8. Um, Mendes showed up in Fast and Furious 2 as a DHS agent, I think. Also known as Too Fast and Furious, surely. Also known as Too Fast, Too Furious. Uh, they kind of like messing with their titles, if you couldn't tell. Yeah. And she made a cameo at the end of Fast 5. And now she's going to be in Fast and Furious 8. Okay. So, in the same role, more or less, yeah? I assume so, yeah. Okay, so last week we had some really exciting trailers, and fucking hell, if you thought last week was good, you're going to be disappointed as shit this week. Because we're not talking, about, not talking about any trailers. None whatsoever. Well, I outside mean, like, of the trailers that we mentioned when they would be coming out. God, yep. I feel like we're going to meta nearly. <laughs> I, watched, uh, I watched the trailers for this week, and they were extremely meh, so I have saved you from them. Instead, we are going to talk about why we are not talking about the Avengers trailers, and that is because if you put all the Avengers trailers together, you can practically get the whole fucking plot of the film. It's yeah, getting ridiculous. I, I'm, pretty, I, I'm not I, watching any more of them. I'm pretty sure if you look it up somewhere, you can find someone has e- probably edited them all together in such a chronological order that you can figure it out. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, whoever is doing the advertising for this should be put at the end of the 500-person centipede. Yeah, they don't. They don't quite understand subtlety, do they? Yeah, I mean, bloody hell, uh, we've seen the like less is more sometimes, you know. I hope to God they held something back. I don't want to go into that cinema and be like, this film would be so good if I hadn't seen it already. Mm. Yeah. Um. So whoever's running a marketing for the Avengers, get your act together. You know the people are going to watch this film. You don't need to show us every bloody thing in the film. The human centipede is somewhere I mean, out there. It was get. It was getting. It was fine at one stage, but now they're kind of like, as it gets closer, they're just like giving us more and more of the film. And it's just like, but I'm going to be going to it. Like, please don't show us all the cool shit. I like to see cool shit in the cinema. So for fans of fake Jason Statham, I have some bad news. The transporter, uh, whatever the hell this is, the, I think they're prequels. The prequel. I think this is the first of a prequel. First of a trilogy of prequels. Yep. Transporter Refueled has been moved from a high summer release slot in June or July to September. Specifically, September 4th. Now, apparently Europa Corps moved the US release back a couple of months because they wanted the stars of the film to be able to promote the film around that time. it's just for post-production promotion, is it? Yes. Okay, so we're now we're going to do a review of Fury 7. First of all, we're going to give our non-spoiler review of it. And then a- immediately afterwards, we're going to give a completely... A sort of a spoiler-filled discussion of... Yeah, as in film. there will be nothing held back. Yeah, so, okay, if you haven't see it, seen the film, you're perfectly safe to listen to this first half of the review. Don't worry, we'll give you a heads up when we change. Yeah, so... Furious 7, uh, I mean, the Fast and Furious franchise has been, uh, it's got a long kind of history of a few things. Cars, women, and family, and uh, I mean, they're all uh, on display here, first off. It's not particularly deviating from the formula. Well, yeah, I mean, they all those things are definitely included there, I know. Yeah. The difference is that I feel like for this one, they've turned everything up to a fucking well, 11. Every, yeah, it's definitely it's it's over the top in a lot of it. Yep. 
And uh, But that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if you accept the fact that if you hold your suspension of disbelief and if you accept that it's going to be over the top, you know, then it's a pretty damn good film. Yeah, well, I feel like the suspension of disbelief, uh, the way they handled that, I was actually quite impressed with, in that they do a scene at the start of the film mm-hmm. that sets up the tone of the film and what kind of reality this film is going to sit in. Oh, yeah. It's like, this is a film in which things like this happen. This is a, the reality space you were going to be living you in. For the, the, you're talking about the introduction of Jason Statham's character. The introduction of Jason Statham. This is the reality space this film lives in. If you do not like this, you might be able to get, get the start of another film if you get out now. Yeah, completely. Uh, I enjoyed the whole yeah. lot of it, to be honest. I mean, it was very fa- fast-paced as well, you know? Yeah, Which I suppose I... is fitting enough... <laughs> I felt like some of the fight scenes they underutilized. Like when they they brought in Tony Ja and Ronda Rousey for this one, right? Mm-hmm. Ronda Rousey is an actual MMA fighter, and Tony Ja is one of the best martial artists ever to work in cinema. Mm-hmm. And I felt like the way that the action was shot with the cameras uh, constant intercutting, and it was around like camera around two feet from the from the performance. Performers didn't really do it, do these performers justice. Like they have fantastic yeah. sports people, and they were clearly doing fantastic stunts that didn't feel as good as they could have been because the camera work was so <sighs> spastic. <laughs> but uh, you you also said that you were actually impressed with the editing of some fight scenes. Yeah, like uh, or I, this, this I suppose was towards the later end of it. Yeah, I, I mean, there is one fight towards the end that I loved the uh, loved the editing on. Mm. And I feel like the editing throughout the film, it was maybe the best that that form of action has been done, the yeah. stupid shaky cam action. Like, they did a hell of a job in the editing room. But that being said, I still feel, uh, feel like it underutilized performers. Yeah, I suppose you're right to an extent. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, uh, Tony Ja, I he was uh, Tony Ja did about a three-minute-long take action scene mm-hmm. with no flaws in it and a, a huge amount of stunts. That guy is capable of uh, absolutely amazing things. It's got the cars, bloody hell, does have the cars. It's got the girls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, like there is uh, there are times where like you're worried that the camera is going to give an actress a gynecological exam. Yeah, and I guess in the they also had to deal with the Paul Walker thing. Yeah, I think they did that quite yeah, well, actually. Knocked that out of fucking parks. I mean, it was. But that was uh, the kind of character interplay I was talking about, though. Yeah, but I I wasn't particularly happy with. It was about as subtle as a jackhammer. Most of the ca- yeah, subtle as a jackhammer, which is fine because this is a Fast and Furious film. Well, I wasn't particularly happy with the rest of the character interplay, and his character, his plot line felt crowbarred in, and if you, it felt like that plot line was sort of it was a quiet plot line throughout most of the film, like it was given a few seconds here and there for most of the film, mm-hmm. and then it's a, kind of made to be the apex of the film right at the end. Which, I mean, it, it was a beautiful tribute to their friend. Yeah. But in terms of the flow of the film, I feel, I feel like it's screwed with things. Uh, I can definitely, yeah, as I, you can feel I, the tone, the shift, in, the weird shift in the tone. Yeah, like, uh, mm. it's just, a, uh, it didn't, it didn't feel like they'd uh, made that enough of a point in the film that it felt like a proper payoff at the ending as a film, no matter how kind of heart-rending it was. I don't think they would have done it like that if he wasn't dead. Yeah, it serves the reality that the film was born into well, but it doesn't serve the film itself well. So, uh, okay, numbers. Um, I'm going to give this a B. I'm going to yeah. give it an 8 out of 10. So, um, I, uh, I'd i highly recommend go, going seeing it. Just know what kind yeah. of film you're getting into. I think for what it, for what it is, and uh, and it does ex- it basically, it does exactly what it says on the tin. <laughs> yeah, it does. Fast and Furious. Okay, so we're hitting spoiler territory now. Yay. Um, I felt like it, what kind of, kind of was most disappointing about the film 
was how difficult it was to care at times. It felt like the stunt came first. Oh yeah, the stunt came first, but it was a spectacular stunt. Yeah, like it, it re- it, they really were fantastic stunts. The one that really comes to mind is when the rock drops the fucking ambulance on the drone. Ah, uh, that was just ridiculous. Lee brilliant. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, that was ridiculous. I mean, like, and I feel like no matter how good the stunt was, they didn't earn the stunt. What do you mean now? I, it felt thrown in there. I felt like it, there wasn't enough set up on that stunt. You could set up the rock fucking tracking the drone and trying de- trying but desperately the, the, the to thing is, it. To an extent, it was that it came out of nowhere, you know what I mean? Yeah, it came out of nowhere. Surprise, here's the rock. Yeah, but it came out of nowhere in a way that made no fucking sense whatsoever. Okay, again, you're and trying to find sense in a Fast and Furious film. I'm getting to that. And the problem is that they're trying to sew it to this emotional storyline. Okay. Which I don't feel is particularly well handled on its own. All right, if you want to... But when you're trying to weld these two things together, they don't fucking work. Yeah, there's all... In terms of the, like, disbelief, it's a case of... How did Vin Diesel, who is basically... His character, as far as I can tell, he doesn't actually have any training in terms of, like... Uh, you know, in terms of black... And- in case they didn't make it clear enough in the film, he's from the street zone. <laughs> yeah, but in terms of... he's a, he, Isn't he, like, a mechanic and a street racer, right? Yeah. And then he he's taking down a guy who who apparently kicked the shit out of, like, tw- 20, like, operatives sent in to kill him. Yeah, like... Uh, he's throwing him around like a rag doll at one stage. <laughs> That's definitely a problem. I feel like it was the least of my concerns yeah. at that point in the film. Like I feel like uh, they saw uh, they sold the film wrong, and I don't mean by marketing. I mean by the way they sold the film with Jason Statham at the in that scene at the very start where he has murdered everyone in the hospital who wanted to murder him, and. <clears throat> Then they start feeding you uh, an emotional storyline about your uh, about Letty getting her her memory back. Yeah, and, that that felt kind of thrown in, to be honest. Yeah, like that that stuff could go. In order for to keep this franchise going and going and going, you need to have some kind of an emotional attachment to the characters, and yeah. you need the characters as an emotional attachment to each other. Yeah. And so you need to kind of that's probably the reason I'm guessing. But. The thing about it is, uh, they're doing it too much. One, they're uh, okay, doing yeah, this yeah. weird family thing that doesn't gel with what else, uh, what they're doing, and I feel like uh, even a, a fucking Expendables plotline would serve this film much better. Well, you well, can you can do emotional, but you can do a film about men who care, uh, men and women who care about what they are doing yeah. and who care about each other without these uh, stupid amnesia storylines. One other thing about the ending that kind of didn't work for me was mm-hmm. that by the end of it, Jason Statham just kind of collapses into a car park. Yeah, that was a bit weird. Yeah, like he goes, and I feel like he's been... You know what he was in this film? He was the Terminator. He is the, he is the force yeah. who is constantly out there trying to kill you. And then we have the warlord. I feel like the character himself wasn't well set up as an antagonist. Yeah, as in the fact that we don't know who we, what he was like. Yeah, we don't know shit about him. We know he wants this piece of technology, and but... he's a badass, apparently. Yeah, exactly. I think the fact is that the, ma- the main antagonist was actually Jason Statham's character. And this guy was own, was basically a facilitator. Yeah, he was a facil- facilitator, but he was given so much of the impetus for the film that his uh, his character wasn't well served. Mm. Uh, it, like it wasn't well enough served to make us care. I think it's possible Statham will return in the next one or in a later one. Absolutely, I mean, like if you've got Jason Statham, you use Jason Statham. Okay, uh, but in terms of what what did you think of the, some of the actual stunts and stuff? Stunts. Oh man, I, I mean, like, as much as I suppose I, the 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 helicopter, the cars out of the plane come to mind, and the uh, leaping, leapfrogging from one, uh, the fro- the jumping from one building to another kind of comes to mind. Yeah, actually, as much as I maligned it, the moment where the rock dropped uh, the ambulance on the drone was spectacular, mm. and if they had set that up properly, that would have been a capper on the film for me. 
I uh, I feel I and uh, I, I did love the way that he that when he showed the rock getting up, he just like flexes his muscles and rips and basically the things rip apart. Oh, that, yeah, that <laughs> after was... like five days or something, he's completely healed. Yeah, that was glorious. I mean, like the rock kind of he disappears out of this film for a good bit. Yeah. But like the moments they give, he give with the rock are absolutely spectacular. Yeah, as always, yeah. Like, like the the rock continues to be like, screw Kurt Angle. This guy's the real All American champion, you know. Absolutely, and uh, but what the what the actual scenes with the uh, where they jump through from building to building, those are brilliant. Yeah, they look gorgeous. I mean, the way the action was shot for those is spectacular. Absolutely. I mean, what the thing is, I don't think they can get a, like the camera right right up car's asshole. Yeah. And still show all the car, which explains why they had to pull the camera back, which is why those bits look so good and the fighting scenes didn't work as much for me. Exactly. Yeah. Part that I knew that the film was just going to like go completely over the top was like the the scene where they're going out of the planes, you know. Yeah, like I feel like it, they kept going over where they had been previously. Yeah, well, once that happened, it was a case of ah, there is no roof on this thing, is there? Yeah, and I feel like it. That's a great thing. Mm. I mean, like when you have a budget like that, use it. And, <laughs> yeah, it's like they out Michael Bay and Michael Bay in the best possible way. Exactly. Yeah. I just feel like there were elements in the film that didn't need to be there, the poorly sort of film that they uh, they felt like they had to make one film for their friend and then there was this other film inside there which was a spectacularly over-the-top action film exactly. that the two didn't gel together for me. Thanks for listening to Idiot's Odyssey episode 13. I've been Owen Murphy and you can find me on Twitter at Owen, Owen M1990. And I've been Fergal O'Connor. You can find me on Twitter at Interspammer. And you can find The Idiot's Odyssey on both Facebook and Twitter at Idiot's Odyssey. And you can tweet us, or sorry, you can email us at idiotsodysseypodcast at gmail.com. And thanks for listening.